Every time we sing that song, I think of old brother Harry Davy in Adelaide, Australia. And they pronounce that instead of fertile, fertile way. It's the first time I'd ever heard it pronounced that way, probably the first week or two I was in Adelaide, Australia. He was such a great Christian man, and he put his whole heart in everything he did, and especially in worship. And I can still see him there with his gnarled up hands that uh, had so terrible a case of arthritis. Uh, all along the fertile way. So when we sing that, I go back to about 1965 and a place 10,000 miles from here. But brethren everywhere should be interested in sowing the seed of the kingdom. And that's our study tonight. And Josh read from Luke 8, 11 through 18. And I believe the key verses in that section, verse 11, the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And verse 14, the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life choked out the word of God. And then verse 18 that we need to meditate upon, take heed how you hear. In Mark chapter 4, the other, another account of this parable that uh, was in three different accounts of the life of Christ, uh, we have the statement in Mark 4, 24, take heed what you hear. So listeners have a responsibility, certainly the teacher and preacher does, James chapter 3 verse 1 says that. We need to be careful if we're teachers that we weigh our words carefully and that they're accurate. It's scriptural and true. So we're to take heed how we hear. We need to be good listeners. Take heed what we hear. To search the scriptures daily to see if these things be so. Acts 17, 11. Mark's account of this, Mark chapter 4, and you might want to turn there now, has three major parables. There are only six parables in the 16 chapters of Mark. He stressed what Jesus did rather than what he taught. He has many of the miracles of Christ, and uh, I think there are 30 different uh, parables. He only has six. There are 39 miracles, and he has 21 of them. So he stressed not what he taught, but what he did, and yet when he gets down to what Jesus taught, it's very precision honed. And in this fourth chapter of Mark, we not only have the parable of the sower, which was the heart and core of the reading we just had, but he also has the parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom is like that it's tiny as it begins on the day of pentecost and yet it grew and expanded and went all over the roman empire emblazoned truth across the wicked roman empire and changed things because the seed of the kingdom is the word of god and it changes the world that it exists in and then the unique parable in mark only found in mark the parable of the secret seed the preacher's parable we sow the seed we are not aware of what all good is done, but it's our job to sow the seed. And that's the beginning of lessons we learn in the parable of the sower. Number one, be sure we sow the seed, the word of God. No word did the Lord say, go into all the world and preach current events. He said, go preach the word, the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings to every creature and every nation at the end of time, and I'll be with you. He's only promised to be with those who preach the gospel. So Paul said, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. We've been put in trust with the gospel, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. So number one lesson we learn, be sure we sow the seed of the kingdom, the word of God. That's our responsibility. Now what happens after that can well be the responsibility of the soil in which the seed was found. Did it fall on the wayside and never brought forth anything? Did it fall in shallow ground and bore fruit immediately and then when persecution came it died out? When the sun beat upon it, it perished. Was it sown among thorns where the cares and riches and pleasures of this life choke out the word of God? Or was it sown in good and honest hearts that bring forth fruit abundantly? Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold based upon abilities and talents of those that receive it, but respond to it. Now there are lessons we learn from this basic, simple, straightforward parable that Jesus taught and then later explained. The very first parable he taught in Matthew 13 was a parable of the soul. <clears throat> and I suppose other than the good Samaritan and the prodigal son, it's been repeated more than any of the other parables of Christ. But some of my brethren haven't yet learned what it says. Certainly the world hasn't. You know, to those who don't care for the word of God, though the purpose of the parables was to enlighten and to teach and challenge people to live a better life, the result of the parables with hard hearts was to turn them away. I believe there was a purpose in Jesus' teaching in parables. Even though those who were against him didn't comprehend because they didn't want to, but they're taught in such a striking way 
of uh, memorabilia that we can't forget them. And later, when our attitude changes, we come back to appreciate that which once was consternation to us. Our attitude toward it made the difference. I don't know how many people have told me after they were baptized, when I first heard you preach, I couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand you. Didn't like that. Too much a barrage of scripture and just plain, simple teaching and no frills or fancies. But as I continue to read and study my Bible, I appreciate you for it. And some of the best friends I have in the world were at one time a little antagonistic toward the preaching of the Word of God. Now you take the people of the world that hear it for the first time. Do I think that most people in the world are going to like straight, challenging, demanding Scripture? We don't like to be challenged in any realm. We don't want any demands placed upon us. So there's something about the simple, straightforward Word of God that can turn people away if their hearts harden. But later, remembering the power of the Scripture, not the power of the preacher, we come back to hug his neck because he introduced us something that we didn't like at first. But the more we observed our life going in the wrong direction and realized the power of the Scriptures, we remembered what was said that offended us and we come back to it with delight. So the purpose of parables was not to harden hearts. That was a result of parables. But it was... These were taught by Christ 30 different times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in such a wonderful, challenging, demanding, rich way that even enemies became friends by coming back to what they remembered about this type of teaching. And so uh, Jesus taught these parables 30 different times to get people's attention. And even if they weren't favorable toward it first, they wouldn't forget this. It was such a simple and yet wonderful, awe-inspiring type of study. But uh, that's the first parable Jesus taught. And then he explained what it meant in Matthew 13 and Luke 8 and so forth. Now here are the lessons you learn in the parable of the sower. We'll have time for the mustard seed and the preacher's parable, the secret seed parable in a moment. <clears throat> but here are the lessons we learn and listen carefully. We learn that the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Therefore, we need to sow that seed, the word of God. We do not need a public speaker that could just as well be teaching that lesson at the Kiwanis Club Tuesday at noon or the Ladies' uh, Tulip Society on Thursday. We don't need that. We need to be sure that we preach the Word clearly and plainly where it can be understood and where it will challenge. Our responsibility then is to sow the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God. The seed of the kingdom is not popularity appeal. It's not fancy words. It's not graphic illustrations, though they can be effective, as these parables were, in a sense, illustrations of common day practice, beside which he placed a heavenly meaning, a spiritual intent. But we need to be sure we sow the seed. I'm going to go further. Members of the church need to be sure that where they attend, the preacher preaches the Word of God. They demand that he do that. We could stop this liberal stuff overnight if members of the church really fulfill their role in the New Testament church by demanding Bible preaching. Now, again, we're not talking about a certain style or kind of Bible preaching, just so it's biblical, contextual, thus saith the Lord, and not the words of men. I never shall forget uh, early in the first month that I taught in my first school of preaching after coming back from Australia in 1965 and 66, a fellow who really thought he was somewhat and smarter than anybody else, though he was a student, after I spoke, to about 230 people in uh, the assembly, chapel, or whatever they wanted to call it that morning. I was teaching upstairs in the class where he would be, and he followed me up the stairs and pulled me off to one side and rebuked me for preaching the Bible. He said, tell us what those verses mean instead of just making another verse of commentary on that. I said, no, wait a minute. Are you realizing what you're telling me? First of all, he had no right to talk to a teacher like that. Secondly, he was wrong. Third, his attitude was bad. But I just pulled him into the library and shut the door. Just between me and him and the Lord. And I said, you realize what you're asking me? You want more of my words and men's words and less of God's word? You don't want the Bible to be its own best commentary? You don't want the Old Testament to comment on the new and the new on the old? And I probably used a hundred scriptures there in those 20 minutes letting the Bible speak. And then the scriptures say, if any man speaks, speak as the oracles of God. First Peter 4, 11, and preach the word. Second Timothy 4, 2. Tell the things that adorn sound doctrine. Titus 2 verse 1. His eyes kept getting bigger and bigger, I guess. He didn't think I'd talk back to him. We later became pretty good friends. He even mentioned my name in a book or two that he wrote. But there's the attitude a lot of people have. Less of God's word, more of men's words. 
Let's have flowery human expressions and less of divine revelation. The only problem with that is Jesus said, the words I have spoken, the same will judge you in the last day. John 12, 48. We better get ready for the judgment day. But we live in a time where people want polished public speaking, whether there's even a verse of scripture in it. I heard a fellow about uh, 40 years ago now that was considered one of the two or three best preachers in the churches of Christ. He used one verse at the beginning and that was the last time he ever came close to the Bible. He didn't say another single word from the Bible after that. I was visiting with two preachers who were there that night and they asked me what I thought about it. And I said, not much. One of them was a local preacher where that man was preaching in a meeting. The other would make a triplet of all three of them. I said, I didn't care much for it. And they said, what do you mean? I said, didn't use but one verse of scripture. I came to hear the Bible. I came to hear gospel preaching, Bible preaching. That was the last thing they said to me for the next hour. They didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know how to handle what they were saying except the response I gave. Let's be sure under the heading of the parable of the sower, the first parable Jesus taught that we do sow the seed, the word of God. And when we invite people to come here, they'll hear the word of God. That ought to be our goal. Now, whether it's textual, expository, verse by verse, or book, chapter, and verse, quoting that backs up the other verses, just so it's Bible preaching. So I'm not talking about a certain style. One of the best sermons I ever heard in my entire life, and I've heard thousands of them. I heard about 50 years ago, and I can tell you what the subject was and who the preacher was and where I was sitting, enraptured, and all that he did was take the 51st Psalm, David's Prayer of Penitence, and expose what each of those verses meant and how they fit together with the life of David and Bathsheba and Uriah and Israel. Never heard a better sermon. It wasn't book, chapter, and verse, back up what you said. It was just verse after verse in the same context with application in the life of the one who wrote it and who prayed that prayer. That's Bible preaching. So we need to appreciate the fact that we must, in view of the parable of the sword, be sure we preach the word of God and demand that it be preached. If I were an elder looking for a preacher and I get calls from preachers and elders two or three a week, sometimes more than that, preachers wanting a place to preach, elders wanting a preacher and want me to recommend, and sometimes my name is on the list of the references the preacher who's wanting to move to that place and they'll call me i've had that happen about three times in the last 10 days here's what i tell the elders be sure when he comes that he teaches a bible class too i'd rather have a good bible class teacher than a good pulpit preacher because if he knows the scripture that's what he'll teach in the pulpit as well as the classroom i said i'd also interview his wife and see if she really was a helpmate to him and would be a good thing for the congregation then I'd be sure to talk to him about what he thinks the role of a preacher is and what his responsibility is. And then I'd let him ask you some questions too about elders, about where you stand. I said too many times we bring a fellow in we don't even know really. But be sure that he preaches the word of God. But let him teach a class too. Let him preach Sunday morning and Sunday night. Get him in every kind of position he'll be in and see if he sticks with the word of God and knows the word of God and is continuing to study the Word of God. So, under the parable of the sower, be sure we sow the right seed, that we scatter it widely. Number two, be sure we let God give the increase. See, a preacher is not a policeman. He's a preacher. If he preaches the Word of God, he doesn't police it. If they're elders, they ought to oversee the flock, and that includes include the preaching and teaching. And elders could stand behind a good preacher when he taught the truth, whether some people didn't like his personality or not. Elders ought to say, did he preach the truth? Did he evince a love for Scripture? Did he sow the seed of the kingdom? The point is, be sure that we don't try to police what we preach. That's the downfall of a lot of preachers, and especially younger preachers. They believe that if everybody doesn't do immediately what they taught, uh, they're in bad trouble because they hadn't implemented in their lives immediately what he taught. They may be still studying and searching the scriptures to see if it's so, Acts 17 11. It may take a little while for them to purge sin out of their life and be sure that what the preacher preached wasn't his opinion but the word of God. And some preachers are far more interested in policing their opinions than the scripture. But it's not their place to do either. Their purpose is to sow the seed. Now, how people receive it 
is another matter. But God gives the increase. Paul, the greatest preacher other than Christ made a record of, said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 6. And so we need to understand that after Peter and the others had preached so valiantly on the day of Pentecost, it was the Lord who added the saved to his church. Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47. And in Revelation 3, he spoke to those whose names he had added to the Lamb's book of life and said, unless you repent, cleanse your garments, walk with me in white, I'll purge your name out of the Lamb's book of life. It's the Lord who enforces what is preached. It's his word. We're just his servants for Jesus' sake. And what releasing is done, what adding to or taking from the book of life belongs to God, not us. We need to understand that. Now, we are told in six places in the New Testament to withdraw from ungodly members. But that's based upon them not following the word of God anymore. But ultimately, the last parable Jesus taught in Matthew 13, the fishnet, those who were not disciplined in this life will be purged from the net, the evil ones cast out for all eternity by the Lord himself. So the Lord will take care of the ultimate discipline. But the point is, be sure you sow the seed, the word of God. Be sure you don't try to police it. That you let the Lord do the adding and the subtracting. Though you practice church discipline so they won't have to be subtracted. So we have a responsibility, not the ultimate responsibility. <clears throat> be sure and let the Lord do that. <clears throat> That's his work. That leads me to the third point. Don't be so disappointed you get discouraged when people don't do what you preached and don't take up the seat of the kingdom of the word of God. When I first started preaching, it broke my heart every Sunday night that everybody that needed the admonition I'd given didn't respond. I perhaps was response crazy like a lot of preachers are. I knew a man who was a brilliant young man who went to Iowa to preach after he got out of school and out of preaching in his home area near Sweetwater, Texas, and he went up there to preach, and he came back about six months because he had no responses. See, he thought that he not only had to sow the seed, he had to ride home and say, we baptized four tonight, six Wednesday night, 13 Sunday morning, and he just quit. Well, he came back and continued to preach, but not in a difficult area, quote, unquote. He didn't understand evangelism. And that somebody has to go to the difficult places. And if we preach the word and please God, we're not responsible for writing up responses. The Lord has the church. Therefore, don't be disheartened when everyone is not a recipient of the word of God like the good and honest heart, the last category of those in the parable of the soul. Some may embrace it quickly. Some may never obey it. And some may obey it and then let the cares and riches and the pleasures of this life choke it out. That's not your fault if you sowed the pure seed. Brethren get so disheartened sometimes. I've worked with these people for weeks and weeks and months and months and they didn't obey. Didn't Jesus say, few there be the find it? He wanted all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. But he acknowledged just as in Noah's day who preached a hundred years to his neighbors and didn't save a single one of them, only his wife and his three sons and their wives, just eight of them entered the ark, and he had a long time to preach. But he didn't say, I, I quit. He realized the message he taught was true. He was doing what God told him to do. In fact, God, through his holy word, calls uh, Peter, uh, Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Second Peter 2, 5. God wasn't disappointed in him. And so don't be disheartened when everyone you've taught or anyone you've taught doesn't respond. You've done what he told you to do. Sow the seed of the kingdom, the word of God. We ought to be ashamed that we're not sowing the seed of the kingdom. Not that we sowed it and no one obeyed. I had a preacher friend that taught in another school of preaching with me. I never met a man in my life that was so response crazy. And while he was teaching in the school in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, he was preaching for a congregation over in Garland. And the complaint I heard was that he will keep the invitation going for an hour. He's got to have somebody come forward. It's almost like someone said, I'll come forward if you'll hush. They'd sing 111 invitation songs with the lights turned down low and several deathbed stories. I've never seen a fella. And if you think I'm talking behind his back, I said those very words to his face at my home when I was preaching at Broadway and Garland. You know where he is today? Number two man in the Boston movement. You know what that movement is? They baptized one another several times. 
They've got to have the responses. And they will move heaven and earth to make one proselyte. Read Jesus' rebuke of the Pharisees in Matthew 23. So he kept on going in that atmosphere that we rebuked him about until he got to a place where you couldn't miss responses because they have all the psychological combat material you'll ever think of. They follow a fellow named Coleman, that, not a member of the church, that wrote how to get your point across and how to build a sect like the Moonies. And that's just exactly what the Boston Movement is. And he's second man in the upper echelon of that because he's got to have responses. Jesus didn't say you've got to have responses. And the elders who send men out shouldn't ask them how many did you baptize, but how many did you teach? And give them tools where they can reach the people so they can have proper responses. I learned all this in the parable of the sword. A sound gospel preacher should never be disheartened or discouraged. His heart may be broken that people he's taught and he knows they know the truth haven't responded, but that's not his fault. And the only legitimate question we have to ask after preachers preach, did he tell the truth? Did he speak the truth in love? Ephesians 4.15, did he sow the seed of the kingdom, the word of God? So be sure you sow the seed. Be sure you let God give the increase. Be sure you don't get disheartened and let the devil run you out of a great work. Just sow the seed. I've had people say, I want you to come out to my house and make my husband or wife or son or daughter obey the gospel. And I say, I can't do that. God won't even do that. He'll say, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open the door, I'll come into you. Revelation 3.20. He said, if a man wills to do my will, he'll know if the teaching be of God. John 7.17. No telling how many young preachers have quit because nobody responded when they preached the word. The Lord didn't say you've got to have responses. He said you've got to sow the seed of the kingdom of the word of God. I wonder how many preachers have quit or have been run off because there were not enough outward responses to their public proclamation of the word of God. Did he tell the truth? Did he sow the seed? God said, that's good. Well done, good and faithful servant. I never read where the Lord said you've got to have so many responses. I have never even read where he said you have to have any. He just said preach the word, sow the seed. There's no telling how many people we taught in Australia through the large teaching articles. They were just about as long each Friday as that right there. It cost us most of our working funds. But we baptized 70 adults while we were over there, and most of them through that teaching. It's the only medium we could have. They wouldn't let us on the radio or TV. Uh, the Ministerial Alliance blocked all that for us. But they couldn't stop us from writing large articles in the Adelaide Advertiser that was owned at that time by Murdoch, who's come over here and bought up a lot of the papers and the TV stations. That's where he started, right there. It was the only newspaper in all the state of South Australia. A million people read that. And on Fridays, regularly, we had a teaching article. And it was very straightforward. They couldn't stop us from sowing the seed that way. And good and honest hearts responded to it. Probably in the time we were there, 300 or 400,000 people read it. But I didn't think because only 70 adults obeyed the truth that we'd fail. I thought that's successful. And it wasn't my success. It was the Word of God, plainly taught. The point is, did he sow the seed? God will give the increase. Don't blame yourself if people don't respond to faithful preaching. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, we're to teach faithful men the faithful word that they may be able to teach others also. Lessons we learn. Another lesson we learn is that everybody may not be as productive as other people. Some may have more ability, more talent. They might have a depth and intensity others who obeyed the gospel will never have. Perhaps that's like the parable of the talents. Five talent men, two talent men, one talent man, and each one was to reproduce according to his ability. That was the responsibility. And the one talent man didn't do anything for fear if he did something that might be wrong. His attitude of God was he was an austere, difficult, exacting judge that wants to strike me down, so he did nothing. But the five-talent man produced five more. Two-talent man the same. The point is, everybody doesn't have the same ability to achieve, but even the one-talent man can obey the gospel and be worth something. And that leads me to another point. If you're a one-talent person or a two-talent person and you see five-talent people around you, you say, I, I just quit. I'll never be able to do that much. So I won't do anything. That's what the devil wants you to think and do. But if each of us, one-talent, two-talent, five-talent, whatever, do the best we can with what we got, look at the increase that will come. 
and give God the glory for the power of the gospel. And because we energize our life to not just sit in warm benches. Why, if we could activate every member of the church and let God evaluate their talents, their abilities, and they'd really be active in pursuing the teaching of others and sowing this seed of the kingdom of the word of God, look what we could do. But so many say, I can't do it. I don't have much talent, brother so-and-so. Each one of us can reach someone else. Or we even try it. There's an old rhyme that may not be exactly right, but it has a principle in it. You must save another soul if you would save your own. The door of heaven is closed to him who comes alone. I'd say this, if you haven't tried to teach anybody, the door of heaven is closed. There's a responsibility for us. Whatever we can do to spread the gospel, it may be that we have the ability, financial ability to help support a hundred preachers that go out and do what we may not feel we're capable of, but we can still do something besides supporting them, encourage them, and teach in our own way, the best way we know how, those about us, and maybe it's to exhort brethren to be stronger. Exhort one another every day, lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 3.13 reads. And so these are lessons, practical lessons we learn, and that everybody who does respond will not have the same abilities, and we shouldn't say, well, I converted that fellow, but he's almost worthless. If he is faithful to God and you reached out and drug him out of Satan's domain with the beautiful power of the gospel, that's quite an achievement. And you need to encourage that person to come on and do better. I baptized a fellow that uh, was zealous and ardent in the business world. I had no idea how far he would go as a Christian. It wasn't very long that he was saving other souls and teaching and preaching. Within six months, he was a better preacher and teacher of the Bible than every other member of that congregation that had been there 35 years. I had no idea he'd have that ability to keep on keeping on, trying to save souls. So we never know. When we get the ball rolling, get that seed sowing, what will happen? And when we reach people that have the ability to bring forth a hundredfold, and they do, and we had just the tiniest part in their conversion and their growth as a Christian, can there be any greater joy than that? So we need to realize from the parable of the sower all of these points. And ultimately, God is the one that puts his approval on the whole machinery of that work. Were we faithful in sowing the seed? Were we aggressive in keeping on sowing the seed and maturing those who embraced that seed and became Christians? I've been in places where we converted someone that had great potential as a leader in a community. And yet it wasn't long till the discouragements of the world Cause him to quit. Some heard it and some going to obey it, but it just sat idle there by the side of the road. By the wayside, never did even produce fruit in their life. Others that had tremendous ability and had financial awareness of how the Lord needed some funds to support the gospel and were very successful in the business world themselves and were on their way to heaven in a zealous uh, way, allowed the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life choke out the Word of God. I think of that pilot in Wisconsin who was the pilot for uh, uh, Kimberly Clark uh, Corporation that had its headquarters in our little town of Nina, Wisconsin. They now have it in the Dallas area. But this fellow was the pilot that flew all the big shots in that company all over the world, all over the country, into Canada and Mexico and elsewhere. He made more money in a month as a private pilot for those uh, ambassadors of that company uh, he probably made more money in a month than all the rest of them, all the other men in the congregation made in a month. He was the poorest giver we had and griped about what little he gave. And one day a fellow that made $55 a week at a paper factory there in that town put more money in the plate when we were raising funds for a property we just met in a rented hall. He put more money there than that fellow gave in a year. And it stunned this fellow because he happened to help count the money that day. That that fellow, 50 years old, working in a paper factory, would outgive him in one gift for a year of what he gave. And after that, he quit his braggadocio. The point is, this brother did the best he could, this did the least he could. So the devil reaches out through never allowing the word to germinate by being so shallow when they receive it and the sun beats down upon it and they quit to the fellow who boasts highly and 
is choked out by materialism and then the good and honest heart with varying abilities producing much in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus taught about the nature of the kingdom of God in the parable of the mustard seed. I believe of all the 30 parables Jesus taught, this is the one that's overlooked the most. One of the tiniest seeds that could ever be planted was a seed for a mustard tree. And it became, it began to grow from such a small beginning. No one had any hope it'd grow at all. And slowly but surely, as God gives the increase, it grew to such a tree that the birds of the air could nestle in it. It became much, much larger than anyone ever dreamed it would. The kingdom of Christ that began on the day of Pentecost. Twelve faithful men. In the busy, workaday, evil, licentious Roman Empire. Why, Caesar thought he could just step on that seed and it'd be gone. But the Lord added to the church 3,000, then 5,000, then a great company of the priests, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, and the Word of God grew and multiplied. It really is an interesting study in Acts 2.41. Acts 4, 4, Acts 5, 11 through 14, Acts 6, verse 7, Acts 12, 24. Mightily grew the word of God and prevailed, Acts 19, 20. Their sound went out in all the earth, Romans 10, 18. And lo and behold, it had covered, it emblazoned the truth across the Roman Empire to such an extent it had enough influence to help put down the mighty Roman Empire. And in Revelation 11, 15 through uh, 16, the kingdom, the kingdoms of this world, have become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ, and He, Christ, shall reign forever and ever. Earthly empires rose and waned. They came and went. But the kingdom of God's dear Son will stand to the end of the world. Daniel 2.44 And even the bars of death could not prevail against its establishment. Matthew 16.18 It began slowly, small, seemingly insecure, unimportant, just a little tiny dot on the map of the materialistic and warring world. And yet it outlasts empire after empire. And still it stands and will until it becomes the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4, 18, 2 Peter 1, 10, 11. So don't be concerned if you're a member of a small congregation meeting in a small building or a rented hall in a difficult place. When we moved to Adelaide, Australia, we had one of those small halls on an insignificant street you had to know the bus schedule even find it. Way out on South Marion Road in a city of 800,000 then, now a million or more, Adelaide, Australia. We met in a rented hall on the backside of a deli. It only seat about 50 people maximum. But we grew. We had to have someone build a baptistry for us. They didn't even know what that was. We had that in a little shed that we rented from that same fellow. That's where we baptized many of those 70 adults that we taught baptized in Christ. Then we moved right down the middle of the city to one of the better rented halls and really began to let our message be known and seen and all of the trams and trolleys and buses meshed right there at that square and it was a wonderful place to meet but it's still a rented hall. We were still considered a fly by night unit but the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Don't be disheartened. You may start small I have a picture somewhere. I don't have a big box of pictures and so forth. I'm not, not a cameraman. But I have a picture somewhere. A cold winter day in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And everybody that met there that afternoon, that rented hall, was in that picture. There were four of us. Three of them, my wife, our son, and myself. Another picture like that in Williston, North Dakota, outside of rented hall. Had about 15 people there. The Word of God grows. The seed of the kingdom sown can be very encouraging and very vital in the lives of people. But then he closes in Mark 4, 26 to 29 with the preacher's parable, the parable of the secret seed. Someone sows the seed. No one knows that it germinates and brings forth. But in the day of judgment, we'll know. We're to sow the seed. God gives the increase. We may not know in our lifetime the people converted by the seed we sowed. But we're to sow the seed and let God give the increase. And have faith and confidence and trust in God's promises. I don't know how many people have come to me and said, I heard you in a gospel meeting in Odessa in 1973. You visited me in the hospital there. I was burned almost to death. I remember that fellow. His wife said, my husband now as well. And there he stood. 
he and I were baptized in Christ because you taught us all those years ago. In a place I'd never been before in Tennessee, Friday night and Saturday, people came and said, I read your articles. Had a letter waiting for him when I got home. Read your article in 1984 on a certain subject, and they can't even find that in their files at the Gospel Minute. Could you please send me that outline? It's helped me mightily. Well, that was many years ago, and I'd never heard of that fellow. He didn't know me, but he'd read something I'd written. I was sowing the seed, and it helped him bless his life. And I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on the Word of God. That's why I'm so glad I chose when I was 19 years old, though I'd already preached several times, that for the rest of my days I'd preach the gospel. I'm so glad I made that decision. I was going to be a football coach or a sports writer. I'd done some of those things. I'm glad I chose to be a gospel preacher because everywhere you go if you're faithful and you sow the seed, there can be productivity that you may not be aware of till the judgment day. Where else could you sow seed? That eternal and everlasting in scope. That's why I recommend to you young men to be gospel preachers someday. Whether you're full, fully supported or you do it after you support yourself teaching school or something else. And I've done that also. Sow the seed of the kingdom and the word of God. And the more you can sow it, the better. When I moved to places, elders say, well, what will you be willing to do? And I said, everything you let me do. I want to teach a Sunday morning Bible class, a Wednesday night Bible class. I'll teach a ladies Bible class, a young people's class, and vacation Bible school, a family Bible school. Give me the young people, the teenagers. I want to teach them. I want to be on the radio, TV, write articles of the paper, preach every time you let me preach, in meetings and lectureship, the more the merrier, because the more seed you sow, the more good that potentially can be done. These are the things I learned from this magnificent, simple first parable of Jesus. And there are many more lessons, just as many as that. Isn't the Word of God powerful and beautiful and simple and straightforward and converting and comforting and challenging? We now extend the Lord's invitation. It's His and not ours. Since He asked the church, it's His church. And He's the one we should appeal to. What did He tell me I need to do to be saved? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. Salvation is only in Christ, Acts 4.12. So baptized into Christ to put on Christ, we begin our life of sowing the seed in lip and life, by example and our word of mouth. And when we come to the end of the way, we'll have cause for no serious regret. And in the day of judgment and on heaven's golden shore, we can meet people we taught. That are there because we taught the word of God and not something else. Let us stand and sing.